Great. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, a brief uh, bit of background on myself. I uh, started as a land care coordinator in WA. I grew up in southern New South Wales in a ho on a hobby farm. Moved to WA, um, spent time working with farmers on land care activities and salinity abatement and uh, monitoring uh, frogs and uh, biodiversity threats. Uh, then to the Birchup Cropping Group where I had the pleasure of working with Lauren Rickards uh, during the millennium drought. I was there for 10 years and once I left it started raining. Should have left <laughs> earlier. But we got Lauren in as a thinker in residence because we were so stressed about, you know, from the external conditions and we're really struggling to think outside the box about how to survive a long run of dry conditions and think about even a, a future that there was light at the end of the tunnel. And Lauren helped us um, <coughs> as our thinker in residence and helping us with a social research project because we couldn't go grow crops uh, with no <coughs> rain to do research on, so we researched people and we researched how farmers were coping with drought over successive years. Um, so hats off Lauren for changing the social fabric um, and the resilience of our, <coughs> of our community. Um, Simon, I remember uh, some of those points that you had up on your slides uh, and one of the projects that Birchip ran when I was there was uh, a project to uh, work with the closing of open water channels and uh, removal of dams from the landscape and instead establishing small wildlife ponds uh, initially to bring some frogs back uh, into the area and then subsequently to help uh, support appropriate wildlife uh, engagement. And after that I uh, moved to the Foundation for Rural and Regional Re Renewal based in uh, Bendigo, uh, which supports small communities across Australia with philanthropic government and private investment. So really focusing on uh, communities of less than 10,000 to support anything that was anything except religion and sport and that they're kind of really like related in many rural <laughs> communities and after that I thought um, I got the opportunity to do something really different uh, and have the next step in my career lattice which has always been going laterally and sideways and but largely connected to agriculture and rural communities and I took on this role uh, heading up rural bank which uh, provides <coughs> capital for Australian farmers <coughs> So it's a beautiful opportunity for me to share some of my thinking around uh, the future landscapes for farming and agribusiness, given my background in small communities, social fabric of communities, farmer-driven R&D, and now funding agriculture in Australia. <coughs> so I wanted to um, reflect a little bit on the past 20 years and then look ahead. So there's 58% of Australia's land mass that is uh, managed by farmers, according to ABARES. And I thought I'd share a little bit about the agricultural journey and context um, before I look forward, because the past is always a good indicator of the future in terms of some of the ways that you've tackled issues and some of the achievements that you've had, regardless of looking forward and thinking that those challenges are actually much bigger and more challenging than what we've faced to date. We certainly believe at Rural Bank and any of the communities I've worked in agriculture <coughs> that the future for agriculture is bright and there's good reason for that because agriculture is one of the two oldest professions in the world. Agriculture and prostitution, fundamental <laughs> to our society. <laughs> Women are exceptionally important in both. <laughs> but with world population and consumption rates on the rise, we do know that we'll have to produce more food in the next 40 years than we have in the last one, uh, 10,000. And so every agricultural landscape and those involved in agriculture have an opportunity ahead of us. Now ABARES forecasts that in 22-23 um, that the gross value of agricultural um, production will be about 63 billion and water culture in particular in Australia is expected to increase by about 17 percent. Aussie farmers have been at the forefront of innovation for quite a long time and they, we actually have the second highest percentage of young farmers under the age of 35 in the world and yet the images that are portrayed in the media about Australian farming communities is a stereotypical grey-haired um, not particularly sophisticated, well-dressed, presented individual um, that is responding in a knee-jerk reaction. 
and we need to challenge that status quo and young farmers in Australia are very much wanting to change the image of their industry and change the image of how they're tackling really big issues of climate risk, animal welfare and production. So if we look back over the last 20 years, um, <coughs> agricultural industries certainly have become more productive around the world. Um, some of the world's staple crops like rice and wheat have increased uh, in production on average 1% every year, about in line with population, population growth. And that increase in production is not because there's increased land al allocated to agricultural production. It's because of growth in, um, in the way we've actually been able to manage and grow a crop, even though it's been done with a fair bit of seasonal volatility. <coughs> In livestock uh, industries, <coughs> milk and beef production has, has increased by 1.6% or 1% respectively over the last 20 years. And although annual increases might sound small of 1 or 2%, if you think about the cumulative differences um, over two decades, in the case of milk um, and wheat production, the world's going to produce 200 million tonnes more milk and almost 150 tonnes more wheat in 2018 compared to 1998 and the majority of people in the room will have been born at least in that period of time, or alive. Um, so all of this, despite the fact that this year, because it's volatile and we do have a drought, we'll have the smallest production year in the last 10 years. If we look at broadacre farming since 1990, the growing season rainfall has declined 28%, and our average maximum temperatures have increased by one degree. Yield potential has actually gone backwards by 27%, from 4.4 tonnes to 3.2 tonnes per hectare. But yields have remained quite constant, and I think that's actually a good story, because it talks about farming smarter and using technology <coughs> and innovation. And so some of those technologies and practices have certainly offset, offset that um, yield decline, with farmers becoming more efficient. So farmers have closed the gap in this particular slide from harvesting 38% of potential yield in 1990 to now harvesting 55% of potential yield in 2015. And that's a, some research by Svee Hockman. Agricultural industries have achieved these gains despite some of the change in climate and the millennium drought in Australia and the global financial crisis, which really held on to funds. And over the next 20 years, Agriculture is going to have to deal with some similar big, hairy issues and think differently and outside the box about what we're going to do. So good decision making, practice change, genetic improvement, effective research and development, getting research from what we just talked about then out into users' hands, appropriate financial and risk management. Uh, they're going to remain the tools for us to draw upon, but with the addition of smart technology and connectedness, and I have to put over the blanket with appropriate and bold policy settings. That might be a, what might trip us up. The NFF has set a massive goal of taking agri agriculture to the $100 billion industry by 2030. And there are a couple of suggestions in there that they think are important to get us there. That every farm is connected to the Internet of Things using either traditional or emerging networks. If we stick with the MBM, we might not hit the 2030 target. <laughs> Australia becoming a leader in digital platforms like blockchain to enable seamless global transacting for food and fibre, providing real in-time supply chain monitoring and evaluation. So yes, $100 billion is an aspirational goal, but I don't think it's an impossible one. The next 20 or so years are going to be a period during which automation, <coughs> robotics and artificial intelligence offer technologies that will become widely adopted. And if we reflect on, back on minimum tillage, it took 30 years for minimum tillage to be adopted in a widespread fashion across rural Australia. So it will take some time for these technologies to emerge, to prove their value, and then to be adopted, because they don't just get adopted once uh, research is published. These technologies do offer the opportunity to save labour and boost efficiency for ag production, but they also provide more intensive and data-driven farm management decisions. And for that, we need more sophisticated capabilities and skills and integration so that we can economically change from paddock and flock average management to square metre and individual animal management. 
and we assume thereby achieving increased productivity. Drone and, and bot technology and Internet of Things will be key drivers for the digital agriculture and really dramatically change the way we manage the landscape. IBM's actually estimated that by 2020, which is not that far away, there's going to be 75 million agricultural Internet of Things devices and they're going to be in use globally. While the average farm is expected to generate, on average, 4.1 million data points every day in 2050, up from 190,000 in 2014. So how we manage big data and how we make use of that for decision making is absolutely crucial. Bots and drones will help us scan paddocks, monitor sowing, harvesting, um, analyse plant and animal health and nutrition. <coughs> They'll be able to track livestock, track our um, animal health and, and movement. And they're going to become more efficient um, and really help us think about each and every decision and the impact, not only on just the ag system, but on all the interconnected elements across our ecosystem and our community. Self-driving farm bots and intelligent flying drones are certainly going to be capable of surveying and analysing existing farm data and conditions, at least at the moment, on small-scale farms. The more extensive we get and the more remote we get, the more challenged we are with our current technologies and capabilities. And from ag bots to chat bots. Chat bots are used in retail and <coughs> banking and a whole range of other online services that we make use of every day. How, that's potentially going to be available to our farm managers and landscape managers to draw upon and have explore what ifs in the paddock in making decisions or in the farm office in making their management plans. How far is all this technology going to go? Well, you, know, you could stand here and just say the answer is in technology, but there will be a point when automation is going to have a real impact on farm labour. We already know there's real challenges in getting labourers and people who are willing to do a whole range of roles into rural communities and on farm. And so that physical labour requirement could be aided by these investments. But we do need the skills and capability to effectively use that technology. It won't happen as it is. New technology will see an increase in the traceability in the agricultural system using things like blockchain, as I said earlier. And I think that can bring the consumer, who's, who are demanding a stronger link, to the source of their food, to the producer. And blockchain presents a bigger question as well in terms of how will this technology translate specifically to the farm business. It seems to be easy to put it into practice with livestock and wool, uh, but what's the realistic prospect for a broad acre farmer to see how the blockchain will actually change decisions on farm? <coughs> We know that um, interaction with consumers is likely to be um, closer and closer to the farm and farmers will have to make management decisions that take into account the consumer as one of their key stakeholders. And we're seeing an increasing focus on e ethical farming. I was recently presenting at a wool growers forum and talking to a, an <coughs> editor of Vogue magazine and a, a couple of buyers from um, high value um, uh, uh, apparel uh, lines. And they were very much talking about how their end consumers, particularly in Europe and the US, are wanting to know exactly how that, that fibre was produced and in what environment that animal was raised. We could, uh, the banking industry certainly had its social licence brought into question this year. And I think that's <coughs> going to happen for the, uh, increasingly for the agricultural industry and think about its social licence. For example, the recent discussion on glyphosate use going to be easily, uh, increasingly easy for consumers to be able to influence that debate, um, potentially with lots of misleading pieces of information because of how easy it is just to put information out there, causing obtuse public reactions that may not always fully understand the impact from an ecosystem services and a farm business and profitability perspective. Another industry taking a very deep look at its animal ethics and social licence is the live export sector at the moment, particularly live sheep trade in the current juncture. And regardless of uh, when that trade concludes, because I think it's inevitable that it will, it actually will influence the people within that value chain and farmers in terms of how, who and when and where they choose to market uh, their produce. 
So this will have substantial impacts on a number of broader <coughs> rural communities and the financial capability <coughs> and cap capital they have to reinvest back into their community and their farm business. We're certainly seeing increasingly the power in social media and traditional media to create a movement that influences future agricultural landscape management. 3D printed meat, I think, is another um, one that presents a real opportunity for the Australian agricultural sector. I see in the future that choices will be made about a naturally produced product versus a th synthetic produced product. And you may choose to have a synthetic produced product that something's been printed off, um, and specifically to your nutritional requirements, you might have the home printer. The local butcher in Birchip might actually have the printer and you choose a price point and a, and a makeup and a footprint, a carbon footprint from the printer as opposed to your choice for natural production with all the burping and farting of the cows as much as you like, but in a different type of system. MLA and the industry are, the Meat and Livestock Association and industry are thinking ahead and saying instead of pretending this doesn't exist and it belongs in the technology sphere, this is actually part of agriculture. How do we embrace that and how do we make it part of the consumer choice and therefore part of the agricultural system? And it's estimated it's a $3.9 billion industry opportunity. Now, challenges. There <laughs> There's a plenty. It's certainly going to keep getting hotter and drier and the challenges of land availability with urban encroachment, um, soil health, ecosystem health, water quality and quantity and variability of seasons are all going to get more acute, particularly under um, projected climate change scenarios. And in, in response, increasingly sophisticated risk management is going to be essential. So geographic and product, product diversification will be key for the Australian farmer of the future. And we already see many producers choosing to buy their next farm or their next block in very different agro-eco zones, managing their climate risk and their exposure to climatic scenarios. I think innovative farmers in the Mallee region in the future will have a, mix, a, a paddock of a mixed uh, of a crop that can either be cropped for grain or grazed depending on how the season progresses with a mob of lambs. Um, and they'll probably have a printer as well in case it's a dry year and they sell the stock off. <laughs> they'll have a paddock of solar cells that does create cheap energy to, uh, and an alternative source of income. And they'll probably have a range of Melbourne residents that are actually paying for their ecosystem services that come up and, and um, make sure and do a quality assurance check. So who are the future landscape managers? We hear a lot in the media about corporate farms, but there's such a small percentage of farms in Australia um, and, in, and only in particular geographic areas. So we believe that the family farm, or really what we better describe as the family corporate, um, is the best positioned entity um, to take a long-term view of Australian agriculture because this is a long-term play. You certainly wouldn't go into agriculture thinking you can have a short-term benefit. And they are very much looking to invest in the future and opportunities for growth. There aren't too many Australian farm families that are looking at scaling back and getting out of the sector. People see the opportunities, want to embrace the knowledge uh, and partner up to create you know, sophisticated businesses that have appropriate cash flow so they can invest back into their, their key assets. And the first asset is their own health and wellbeing. The second asset is the health and wellbeing of the landscape that they're working with. They are also looking to access equity from others who support food and fibre production and I think that's an absolute opportunity to rebuild the urban and rural relationship. So there is a different way that people can own a part of the farm in the future in a capital sense. Australian ag businesses really are capital intensive, particularly as they're getting larger and larger. They're either getting larger in footprint size <coughs> as some exit the industry, but there's a finite amount of land available, so they're also getting larger through the value chain. As an example, between 1995 and 2013, the average Mallee and Wimmera farm that uh, Simon was highlighting the region for us in Victoria, increased their farm area by 37% and 58% respectively, mainly through land purchase, but also um, through crop intensity, which increased from 67% um, and 58% respectively between the Mallee and the Wimmera. Meanwhile, we're seeing land values increase 5% per annum over the last 20 years. 
So whilst that's growing the underlying asset base for those landscape managers, um, it does change to the, the capital requirements and particularly um, in the likes of lost years and when they're doing succession planning, it really does change the game. And as a result, total farm debt in Australia has increased dramatically over the last few decades. It is now over 60 billion. Now historically, and to this day, farmers have secured debt capital uh, from financial institutions such as banks. And whilst debt funding seems to have been adequate in providing capital um, for the growth of that sector to date in Australia and internationally, alternative sources of capital and new farm business structures will be required into the future. And so for someone whose whole business at the moment as a bank relies on bank debt funding, we recognise that if we don't change and support the industry that is seeking to change, banks will be a thing of the past in Australian agriculture. Therefore, farmers are seeking those different capital structures, and I think this could come from um, private uh, capital funds where investors are wanting to own a piece of agricultural land or participating in the long-term benefit and rather than just contributing to the day-to-day -day operations. And if you look at sort of crowdfunding that is involved, engaged in um, Australian agriculture at the moment, there are a number of farm businesses owned by a whole range of people contributing through ca crowdfunding campaigns and not just traditional financial um, large fund managers. So lots of questions about you know, Internet of Things, lots of questions about synthetic versus natural capital investment and how we support the future family corporate to better manage and engage in the, no the knowledge that's been shared here today. Um, but lots of food for thought. So the future for Australian farmers, I think, is certainly going to hold some pretty amazing changes. <coughs> No doubt, uh, challenges and opportunities, but I think it is a bright future and we need to attract the brightest minds to help address some of those challenges and harness those opportunities. The way that land is managed is certainly going to look different to, the, to today. Whilst we might not necessarily see this kind of setup uh, across uh, rural communities and, and, and landscapes, thinking about how we can maximise uh, the use of technology, and our intellectual innovation on farm is critical and not just in monocultural operations. Because agriculture is required to uh, feed and clothe our global community and how we, uh, how we do that will be influenced by, I think, consumers of the future, researchers and industries working together. And I know a couple of our students mentioned that collaboration <coughs> is critical. We do that and I think eventually government will follow. If we wait for them to take the first step, nothing will ever happen. So I look forward to sharing um, and answering some questions uh, with my fellow panellists uh, after this. Thank you very much.